All right, well, let's begin by looking or reading the text that we're going to look at this evening. And that is Acts 18, beginning in verse 18. I'm going to read to the end of the chapter, which is uh, through verse 28. Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In Cancrea, he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. They came to Ephesus, and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent, but taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills, he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. And having spent some time there, he left and passed successively through the Galatian region and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the Scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the Scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Well, may the Lord bless this part of His Word to our uh, growth in grace this evening. Well, um, this morning, remember, we saw our Lord reach Corinth through the ministry of uh, the Apostle Paul. We saw how the Lord helped him in this endeavor by providing Aquila and Priscilla not only to help him in the making of tents to provide for his um, physical needs, but also to support him in the work of the gospel. You know, it's always difficult to do these things if, if you're basically by yourself. It, it's, it's helpful to have, you know, someone who's working alongside of you, and they provided that kind of support and fellowship for him. And then the Lord helped him by sending Silas and Timothy, um, which we know uh, Silas was the one who went with Paul on the second missionary journey. They picked up Timothy, I believe, who was saved on the first missionary journey, who had matured to the point where he could be helpful, and now they come uh, or came to Corinth, uh, freed him up so that he could devote himself uh, to full-time ministry. And uh, again, uh, that, that is very, very helpful if, if a missionary can devote himself, especially the Apostle Paul, to doing this full-time. Uh, he also helped them by opening the house of Titius Justus. Uh, when the synagogue was closed, as far as, a, as a, a, a platform, you might say, an arena in which to evangelize, uh, the Lord opened this man's house that he might have a place to minister to the Gentiles um, who were coming and uh, wanting to hear the gospel. And then, of course, by encouraging him with the promise of protection uh, so that he was able to minister there for 18 months without fear. And by protecting him when he was falsely accused by turning the persecution around on his accuser, again, Sosthenes, who eventually became a, a, a fellow brother in the Lord Jesus. Now, this evening, what I want us to consider broadly or generally is the end of Paul's second missionary journey and the beginning of the third. And I want us to take a close look at the life and ministry of Apollos, Again, in order to draw principles or keys that will help us in our service to the Lord. Now, first we see Paul continuing to press forward in, in the work. Again, he wasn't daunted by the opposition. Uh, he stayed there, we learn in verse 18, for many uh, days longer. Now, he had just seen that what the Lord had promised, he actually meant. The Jewish mob had dragged Paul before the magistrate, but the Lord had caused this to backfire on their ringleader. And encouraged by this deliverance, he continued. You know, some commentators you know, interestingly say uh, that he may even 
uh, through this interaction with Gallio, been able to make some inroads with the Roman proconsul and his brother. Matthew Henry writes this, and again, I don't know on what basis he says this, but um, he would be you know, closer to perhaps those um, resources that contain this information. He says, some tell us that Gallio did privately countenance Paul and took him into his favor, and that this occasioned a correspondence between Paul and Seneca, Gallio's brother, which some of the ancients speak of. Remember, we were looking this morning at uh, these two men. Now, if that's true, it may also explain why um, perhaps Paul was not the one who was beaten, and it was Sosthenes, because perhaps Gallio was protecting him. Now, we don't know whether this correspondence, this relationship really resulted in, in the conversion of either of these two men. I think if that had happened, we probably would have heard something about it in history. But it should make us stand back in amazement at what the Lord is able to accomplish if we simply trust Him and seek to be faithful. I think we'll see things that we perhaps didn't believe, humanly speaking, could take place. Now, this really is the first key to usefulness, trust the Lord, trust His promises, and continue to move forward regardless of the opposition. Now, secondly, we see Aquila and Priscilla's continuing support. We read in verse 18, Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria, and with him were Priscilla and Aquila. Now, we know that, that Paul you know, typically uh, when something got going in one place, he would move on from there to do something else. So apparently he considered his work done in Corinth of, of breaking ground, so to speak, of, of um, planting seed. And he now purposed to return to the church that originally sent him out. The reason why he's going to Syria is because he's going to Antioch. And Antioch is basically the center of Gentile Christianity. And the church that originally sent Paul out on the first and the second journey, and will send him out also on the third. And Aquila and Priscilla were more than willing to go with him. Now, we'll see later in our passage how the Lord uses Aquila and Priscilla to help Apollos, but we shouldn't miss the fact that they supported and encouraged Paul all along the way. And again, just as a reminder to each of us that none of us can do this work by ourselves. We're going to see the same thing with, is true of Apollos. We need a support structure. We need people to help us. Uh, and so when we do this, okay, when we do this for others, and I'm thinking now Aquila and Priscilla did this for Paul, we should be willing also to do this for others. I believe that the Lord says if we help others to do certain things and they accomplish certain things, that it's like an investment in their ministry. And as we invest in their lives and they receive a reward from the Lord for those things, then we get part of that reward. We're rewarded for helping the person who did this who gets the reward. It's kind of like the, the minister that uh, actually wasn't even a minister. It was some sort of a, a person who had to fill in on the fly on that snowy day that forced Spurgeon, remember, into that, uh, that one particular chapel. Was it Primitive Methodist? I forget exactly. And there was a man who was speaking who really hadn't prepared, didn't really know what he was doing. He kept repeating his text over and over again, and just whatever occurred to him, he said. But the Lord used that passage to convert Spurgeon. And I would say that this man would share in the rewards that Spurgeon gets. I, I think it would be... Um, that would be a good investment, you know, especially in, in the kind of ministry that Spurgeon had and the fruitfulness that he had. So may the Lord help us, this is again another principle, help us not only to do the work ourselves, but to help as many as we can who are also doing the work. That's the reason why we support missionaries, we, um, you know, try to help uh, uh, various ministries as well, and I think one of the best ways that we can help them is through targeted, uh, earnest prayer. So the second key is that we not only do the work ourselves, but we also support others who are doing that work. Now, thirdly, we see Paul becoming all things to all men that he might win some. We read in verse 18, in Cancrea, which is essentially a port city 
on the coast of southern Greece or Achaia as he's head, making his way to get to a, a boat in order that he might get to Syria. He had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. Now, he had his hair cut because of this vow, which was undoubtedly the vow of the Nazarite. That's, that's quite interesting. You know, Samson was a Nazarite. Uh, he had great strength as long as his hair wasn't cut, as long as the vow remained on him, and he broke that vow in virtually every way. And it was the last straw when his hair was cut that his strength left him. Now, growing long hair doesn't make you strong necessarily. It didn't make Paul any stronger, but it does tell us that he took this vow. And this vow was taken by someone who wanted to devote themselves entirely to God for a specific period of time. And for that reason, they would withdraw from certain things um, uh, during the course of this um, vow. And then when the vow was up, they would cut their hair and they would burn it before the Lord. And it was a symbol of their offering themselves up to Him. Now, in Paul's case, it, it's hard to really see the point of taking this vow, isn't it? Because how could he have devoted himself any more thoroughly to the Lord than he already had? He was already a, a shining example of what our Lord calls us to be. You know, we are to be full-time Nazarites devoted to our Lord Jesus Christ. So, is that the reason he took it? it it's quite possible that he took this vow mainly to show the Jews that he was still following the Jewish customs. As a matter of fact, we'll see in, in the later chapters of Acts when he's arrested, he's arrested while he's in the temple, taking four men in there who are completing their vow, that it's possible that Paul and these men were also again under the vow of the Nazarite. But he was doing that in order to show the Jews that he was keeping the customs and the traditions that were handed down by Moses. The fact that he was possibly not keeping them or teaching the Jews not to keep them was a major stumbling block to the unconverted Jews, wasn't it? Our Lord tells us that Jewish believers could keep the traditions as long as they didn't rely on those things for their salvation. So the reason I think Paul did this was he did it in order to remove a stumbling block in order that he might win his fellow countrymen, the Jews, to Christ, to remove any unnecessary hindrance to their listening to him. As he writes to the Corinthians in his first letter, in chapter 9, verse 22, I have become all things to all men so that I may by all means save some. And I think here we have the third key, to accommodate ourselves as much as possible to those we try to reach. Of course, without compromising what our Lord calls us to be and do. Remember when Paul says, uh, as to those, to those under the law, I become as those under the law, to those without law, as those without law, although myself being under the law of Christ. There were, there were limits to how far he would go. So as much as we are able to accommodate in order to reach out to our audience, that's what we ought to do. Now, fourth, on the way to Antioch, he stopped in Ephesus to break ground there, verses 19 through 21. They came to Ephesus, and he left them there, that is Aquila and Priscilla. Now, he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent, but taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills, he set sail from Ephesus. Now, he seems to have been here for really a very short period of time, but long enough to have an effect, long enough to plant a church and to leave Aquila and Priscilla behind to help establish and nurture that church. Now, it may not necessarily strike us as, as um, interesting right, right you know, as I read this, but we do need to realize where Ephesus was. Okay, Ephesus was in Asia Minor. The very area the Spirit of God earlier had not allowed them to go. And I think I told you at that time that, that the Lord was going to bring Paul eventually there. So now was the time. Now was the right time. And he brought Paul there to preach to the Jews. And notice the reception. They listened. They wanted to hear more. A new church was actually birthed. But again, if he had gone there earlier, 
the re results may have been entirely different. So the fourth key is this, that the Lord has His perfect timing for everything. We simply need to wait on Him. You know, we might like to see things happen more quickly. We might like to break down the barriers and go where we believe we really shouldn't be going or somehow sense the Lord doesn't want us to be there. But God has His timing, and we need to be sensitive to that and um, know that, again, because it isn't the right time now doesn't mean it's not going to be the right time later. Now, fifth, we see the end of the second missionary journey and the beginning of the third. We read in verse 22, when he had landed at Caesarea, again, on the other side of the Mediterranean, he went up and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. Now, at first glance, it might sound like he's going up to the church that was at Caesarea and then over to Antioch, but really what this means is he went to Jerusalem. Uh, whenever uh, you hear of a going up, that usually refers, or perhaps, I don't know if it's exclusive, but it refers to going up the hill on which Jerusalem is built. And certainly, that would not be out of character for Paul. He wanted to go up to the church at Jerusalem. He wanted to see the apostles who were still there, to have fellowship with the saints, to see how they were doing, and perhaps report what the Lord had done for him while he was on this missionary journey and how many churches have been planted. But then he went down to Antioch. Okay, he went up and he went down. And it's interesting, when you look at the map, Jerusalem is south of Antioch. We usually talk about going up north and going down south. But that's not the way the Jews spoke. Jerusalem was up, everything else was down. Okay, so when you're up in Jerusalem, you go down to Antioch or you go down wherever it is you're going. So he went to report there, of course, what the Lord also had done through him and through his companions. And we can imagine, you know, what an exciting story that must have been as Paul gave his account. You know, we know what a blessing it is to have missionaries come to the church and to share with us what the Lord is doing through their ministry overseas. Um, yeah, we really need to pray that God would um, bring another to share with us uh, soon. And we can only imagine of how Paul's accounts of what had taken place must have stirred that church. And the interesting thing is we don't actually have to imagine what that story was because the Lord actually had Luke write it down for us. And we've already been reading about it. We've already seen what he's done and what an encouragement it has been to the church and what an encouragement it has been to us ever since. So after this and after a respite, at least from, you know, missionary work. I imagine Paul continued to labor teaching and preaching and trying to build up the disciples in Antioch. Uh, Paul began again, verse 23. And after or having spent some time there, he left and passed successively through the Galatian region and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So now this is the beginning of the third missionary journey. And it starts with revisiting the churches that he had planted on his previous trips. And again, what an encouragement for those believers as they had the opportunity to renew ties with the one who had given birth to them through the gospel. I mean, Paul was their spiritual father. You know, he begat them, as it were, through the gospel. And I think we have another key here that helps to strengthen the work that God is doing. As we reach out to those that we, that we know do not know the Lord, we do need to remember the people we've already reached, whose lives we've already touched, to try to visit and encourage them as the Lord gives opportunity. You know, we've, we've had perhaps some impact in some people's lives, and I think it would be encouraging for them to hear from us and to, you know, show some concern for their well-being. And certainly the Apostle Paul did that. Now, finally, we're introduced to Apollos, and I think there's a lot of encouraging things here. Here's another brother the Lord used mightily to promote his gospel. And again, as we look at Apollos, we need to remember that not, not um, I, you know, none of us here are really built like Apollos. We don't have his gifts. We don't have his abilities. We don't have his learning. But these are things to aspire to as we read about the Apostle Paul. I think we appreciate Paul, and we like to be like Paul. As we read about our Lord Jesus Christ, we would like to be like Him, but of course, we're never going to be exactly like Him in this world. That's reserved for 
for heaven when we finally leave uh, at our deaths. And I think all of us are going to leave at that time because, again, there's so much work to do before the Lord can return. I don't believe it's going to be in our lifetime. So perfection is for heaven, but we still appreciate Him, don't we? And we still look at Him as an example that we want to follow. So we can do that as well with Apollos, follow Him as He followed Christ. Now, the first thing we see about him is something of his background in verse 24. Now, a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, came to Ephesus. Uh, sometimes, you know, we might think Apollos was a Gentile, but he wasn't. He was Jewish. He was a Jew who was born in Alexandria. Alexandria is in the north of Egypt. It's on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It was named Alexandria because it was founded by Alexander the Great. You know, these conquerors like to rise up cities that were, you know, named after them. And it was founded around 333 B.C. And it was a great city. It was a city where the pharaohs actually had lived for nearly 200 years. Now, being a Jew meant that he had the advantage of being brought up in the Scriptures. One thing a Jew would do is listen to what, even whether they're converted or not, would listen to God in the Old Testament when He told them that that's what they needed to do is to raise their children in the ways of the Lord. So like Timothy, Apollos would have known the Scriptures from his youth. And this would give, uh, really have given him a great advantage, especially after the Lord brought him to Himself and he began to understand them for the first time. You know, most people who are converted, uh, well, often don't have any kind of a background in Christianity. And that means they really have nothing to draw on outside of what it is that the person who brings them the gospel tells them. But somebody who may have been raised in a church or maybe even raised in, in the uh, Jewish faith could have a tremendous advantage of having this wealth of information about what the Scriptures say. They may not understand what they mean, ultimately, because they're fulfilled in Christ, and they don't see that until they come to Christ. But when they do come to Christ and they see how it all fits, that's a tremendous advantage. Now, let me just say that this is really a hope that we still have for our children. Because even, even though many of them haven't yet embraced the Savior, the Lord may yet have mercy upon them. And if He does then all that they have learned will then become of help to them, to help them live for His glory. As a matter of fact, I think right now we probably interact with them and they say, well, did anything that we, that we said to them actually get through? But I think it's when they finally come to Christ that those things begin to resurface because right now they're repressing those things, suppressing the truth. But when they come to Christ, if in God's grace He brings them to Himself, then they'll no longer do that and they will begin to understand what it is their parents were trying to tell them for so long. So I believe the sixth key here is this, to read and study the Scriptures. Okay, we need that for ourselves. We need to communicate it also to others, but we cannot communicate what we do not know. So we need to learn the Scriptures. We need to be saturated, mighty, as it were, in the Scriptures. Now, Luke tells us that this man also had substantial natural gifts, and those gifts do make a big difference. He said he was an eloquent man, which likely means a natural orator. It can mean two things. It can mean he's very learned, or it can mean that he's a, a great orator. And I think from what we see in Apollos, he was a great speaker. He could speak in a very forceful and moving way. Can you think about any other great orators in the history of the church? I think of, uh, you know, there's plenty, uh, there's, there's a few, but George, George Whitfield had such powers of persuasion, you know. I think of the story of um, a man who was speaking with Benjamin Franklin, <laughs> and he said, uh, Benjamin Franklin asked him if he was going to go out and listen to Whitfield as he was in town, and he said, yes, he, he was, and he said, are you going to... Um, basically contribute to his orphanage when he, he basically asked for contributions. And he says, no, I'm not. And I'm not going to let this man persuade me. And to make sure he doesn't, I'm not going to take any money with me, so I can't give to it. So anyway, Whitfield comes out, he preaches. Benjamin Franklin is out there taking his measurements to see just how far his voice will carry and so forth. And he sees his friend 
after Whitfield makes this, this uh, appeal, he sees this friend who wasn't going to give to Whitfield going from person to person trying to beg money off of them so he could give to that particular cause because Whitfield was so persuasive. Well, here we have another man who had these powers of persuasion. Now, we'll just pause here for a moment and think about this. We may not have that particular gift, but God has given to us other gifts, right? We all have natural gifts, and we all have spiritual gifts, and we are to use these gifts to promote His gospel. So, the seventh key is to inventory what the Lord has given to us and to use the gifts for the reason why God gave them to us in the first place, that we might serve Him in His kingdom. And again, it may take a while to discover what those things are, but we do have them and we do need to use them. We learn He was fervent in spirit, verse 25. His love for the Lord compelled Him to engage others with the gospel, using again His oratory powers to persuade them to turn to Christ. Paul tells us in Romans 12, verse 11, that we are to be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord as well. Now, it doesn't matter how much we know or how gifted we are, if we do not want to use these things for our Savior, we actually won't use these things. So the eighth key is this, be in God's Word, be in prayer, be in worship so that we might have the kind of communion that will feed our love for the Savior and give us a stronger affection for Him so that we will be fervent in spirit. Apollos was courageous. Luke writes in verse 26, he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. I, I, you know, I, I understand Apollos to be the kind of person who didn't really care what other people thought about him as long as he could honor his Lord. He wasn't afraid to lose friends. He wasn't afraid to make enemies. His only goal, again, was to honor his Savior. Now, here's another key, a ninth key. Pray for greater boldness. If we're crippled by fear, we're never going to be able to serve the Lord as we should. And the only cure for that, again, is drawing near to the Lord and growing more in love with Him. It's the only way we're going to have this kind of boldness. And by the way, I think we understand if we approach somebody with a timid spirit and try to share Christ with them, we usually will end up being more despised by them than able to help them. But when we come with a kind of boldness and, and confidence and a fearlessness, it, it is, can be somewhat intimidating and imposing, and I think it, it subdues sometimes you know, what other people think. And I think you'd be surprised, too, what kind of reaction people will have if you share the gospel with them, particularly when you, when you actually invite them to come to Christ. It seems as though the Spirit of God works through that invitation and humbles them. Not always, but it, it certainly does certainly does happen. Now, apparently, Apollos still had some things to learn. He had been instructed, but only from the perspective of John the Baptist's ministry. You know, maybe he was a follower of John, maybe he ran into disciples of John, uh, which is likely the case, probably disciples of John. He knew that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He knew that He was the Messiah. He undoubtedly had heard about his crucifixion and his resurrection, but there's still a lot more that needed to be known. And so we read in verse 26, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And I think the 10th key here is this, never to be content with our current level of understanding, but to strive to learn more from those who know more than we do, and as Aquila and Priscilla, to do what we can to help those who know less than we do. I mean, that's what Christian discipleship is all about, I mean, helping to strengthen one another in the knowledge of the Lord. Now, we also see the importance of encouragement. Again, we have encouragement in the life of Apollos in verse 27. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him. Now, Apollos, we've already learned, was eloquent, he was fervent, he was bold, he was mighty in the Scriptures, but again, like the Apostle Paul, he was not an island. 
He didn't have everything that he needed in himself. He also required support and encouragement from his brothers and sisters in Christ. And so when he wanted to go to Achaia, and that, by the way, is where Corinth is located. That's, I think, where he was headed. They encouraged him. They also wrote to the disciples who were already there. There was a church planted to welcome him. And when he arrived, he proved to be a great help. But it was because of the encouragement and the help that these others had provided for him. So I think an 11th key is this, not to withdraw ourselves from fellowship with one another, okay? But try to be present, not just in worship, but in each other's lives so that we can encourage and help each other as we strive to serve the Lord. And perhaps, you know, we have means of helping other, each other that, that not all of us have. And we need to do those things again to help, to help one another. Now, when Apollos arrived, verses 27 and 28, he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the Scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Okay? He knew how to defend the faith. He knew how to use apologetics. He was doing what R.C. Sproul encouraged us to do. Actually, he said this came from John Calvin. Apologetics don't con it doesn't convert people, Right? But it does something very powerful. It closes the mouths of the obstreperous, remember, the argumentative, those that contradict. Um, and that, again, is what we are called to do. That's the reason why we went through the series, Defending Your Faith. And by the way, that's also why we're studying Foundations and the other series that we're going through, is so that we will know the truth for ourselves, but also be able to use it to help other people. And uh, so again, the twelfth key is essentially this, to be faithful to learn how to defend the truth. Now, I want you to notice, too, that Apollos was making this defense before the Jews, and that's the reason why he was powerfully refuting them and proving that Jesus was the Christ from the Scriptures. If somebody already believes in the reliability of the, of the Bible, you don't have to prove it to them again, right? You just simply use it. But when Paul was speaking to the, um, the philosophers, the atheistic philosophers, um, not entirely atheistic, but certainly not Christian on Mars Hill, he began by, as we saw this morning, appealing to general revelation to prove the existence of the true God and then bringing it to the Scriptures. So there is a little bit of a difference here, but I want you to see why Apollos took the tack that he did. We just need, again, to remember that we need to know our audience, know where they are, and then begin where they are and seek to bring them to where they should be. Now, the final key is what we learn from Paul's letter to, the first letter to the Corinthians, what he says in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, because this is where this is happening. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. Now, Paul had already broken ground in Corinth. Apollos was just sent over there not only to defend the truth against the Jews, but also to build up the church. He was the one who was watering the church, teaching and nurturing the church. But ultimately, notice who it is that makes the difference, right? God is the one who is causing the growth. Now, we can do basically what the Lord calls us to do all day long, and if the Lord isn't in it, it's not really going to have much of an effect. Okay, but it reminds us that we do all have our part to play. You know, some of us are groundbreakers. Some of us are good at planting seeds, right, planting the gospel. Others of us may have a gift of sort of coming along and watering or nurturing that seed or perhaps helping to disciple uh, Christians. But again, nothing that we do will amount to anything unless the Lord blesses it. And so the final key is remember to pray. Remember to pray and ask the Lord for His blessing on the things you do, that it might bear fruit for His glory. Well, um, let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us to remember these things. By the way, if you want a copy of these notes or keys, let me know. It's a lot to remember. So, you know what? If you don't write it down and you have the memory that I have, you're going to forget everything I just said. And so then what good is that going to do? None, right? 
You got to remember it and put it into practice. Got to incorporate it into our lives. Let's pray that the Lord would help us to do that.